Morning, everyone. Um, so happy you could join us this evening. Um, we'd like first to um, introduce uh, the British Empire Study Group. Uh, I'm Bob Gray, and uh, I'm here with uh, my co-chair, Joan Harmer. Uh, British Empire Group is a group of men and women who have an interest in British Empire philately, and we enjoy the social and technical aspects of uh, learning and uh, sharing. Uh, during good times, we meet at the Collectors Club in New York, uh, Midtown, New York. So British Philately starts with the first stamp collector, uh, a John Gray, no relative, and Stanley Gibbons, uh, the, the world's first dealer. It spreads throughout the British Empire. And um, at one point that was 20 to 25% of the world's population and the equal amount of the world's land surface. But it's even more than that because the British Army has been in most places and where they haven't been, the British Post Office has been. So basically whatever you collect is gonna to touch on British Empire. So some people ask us what is stamp collecting and it's some people it's stamps and albums. For other people it's postal history and studies of postal rates, routes, markings. And for others it's the history of postal artifacts which can be relevant for any historical research. So our next Zoom meeting will be September 9th at 6 p.m. where uh, Steve Zarinsky will talk to us about the road untraveled and there'll be more detail in the announcement. What you're seeing to the right is, uh, so a little housekeeping uh, questions uh, will be uh, live, but feel free to use the Q&A or chat. Uh, following the presentation, there will be uh, time for a, uh, a social discussions. And if you would, uh, like to disable the closed captioning, please click on the live transcript and it'll hide the subtitles. If you don't see it, you won't, you won't see it and won't interfere with you. Um, interested in a topic, send us an email. Uh, we're planning next year's program. And so now I'll turn it over to Joan uh, for a further introduction to today's speaker. Thank you very much, Robert. And let me take down the screen share. Okay, again, welcome tonight. Thank you very much for attending on this August night. It's pretty hot here. It is my pleasure to introduce Ms. Uh, Dr. I was almost said Mr., but it's actually Dr. Arthur Rotten. He, I've known Arthur for a long time. All right, really, and most people have heard of Arthur because you've read, about, you've read his articles in, I think, Kelleher and other Lynn's, I think you've written in a lot of magazines. Uh, you are a lifetime member of the American Philatelic Society. Uh, sorry, lifetime member of the APS, right? Yes. And you're the Luft Award winner. Yes. Luft Award winner. And most, you're a member of the Philatelic Society of London, our friends. And most importantly, you're a member of the Collectors Club. So I, I'm not going to take too much time introducing Arthur because Arthur is better at introducing himself and he could tell you much more about himself than I can. So uh, without any ado, I'm going to turn it over to Arthur. I would say the host has spired. There we go. It's gone away. Hi, everybody. Most of you know me, I suspect. Um, yeah, I've been writing for a long time. Uh, and uh, I wanted to talk a little bit before I go into the formal presentation about how this collection came to be. Uh, those of you who've attended my lectures at the Collectors Club or read my writings know that I'm particularly interested in lateral thinking, uh, ways to bring in a collateral material uh, that uh, is not normally considered because it, it, it's not part of the philatelic world. Um, <clears throat> I started collecting uh, St. Helena uh, because my good friend Phoebe McGilvery, I happened to be sitting in her office in a, in a, in a collection, uh, somebody called about a collection and she looked at me and she says, I know who's going to want that. And she was right. And so I started stamps and covers and quickly realized that I had to do one or the other. So I decided on the postal history, which hadn't been done really. And um, uh, so I started building a collection of the rates and the roots. And in my naivete, I decided, you know, every, the only thing that people know about St. Helena really is that Napoleon was exiled there. And so 
maybe it would be a good idea to start the uh, the presentation, the exhibit, with a letter from Napoleon while he was in exile on St. Helena. <clears throat> well, I went to a, the uh, a New York book fair where my uh, my friend Ken Rendell, who's an autograph dealer, uh, and I asked him, um, I, I'm looking for a letter from Napoleon on St. Helena. And he says, well, I only do US, so he sent me over to a fellow from, from Switzerland who unfortunately, I cannot remember his name and the papers are gone. In any event, this was the first, last, and only time he ever came to the States. So I went to, to, to his booth and he didn't speak much English and I didn't speak much German, but I got across the fact that I was looking for something from Napoleon on St. Helena. He gave this little smile and he says, well, I think I have something over there. So I start going through the book and sure enough, I come along, I come across a note, a little scrap of paper, maybe four by five inches on which is scribbled some, some, uh, some uh, numbers, a total and the big Napoleonic N. And uh, it was priced $2,000. Now this is at a time when a Napoleonic letter was on average $700. So I said to him, how come? And he managed to get across to me the fact that Napoleon didn't write on St. Helena because everything was censored. Well, I'd never heard of that before. And so we got into a correspondence. He went home to Switzerland and he started sending me those days, <laughs> my mail photocopies of, um, of various things related to Napoleon and, his, uh, and the handling of his mail uh, uh, while he was on St. Helena. And uh, I, uh, so I bought a bunch of stuff. And then as I got more sophisticated, I said, you know what I really need is this, this, and this, and this. I need to talk about these things. And he said, well, you better come over here. So in those days, I used to go to London twice a year to, to, uh, to work on the, on the collection itself. So I went to Zurich and I spent a day in his study and he had a pile of papers about two feet high. And what these papers were, were those of Napoleon's aide de camp, uh, Count Bertrand. And uh, Bertrand saved everything. And the papers came for sale 150 years later or 200 years later. And the French didn't buy them. Uh, I guess they were having an anti-Napoleon uh, spasm at that time. So he bought them. And we spent the afternoon going through, actually I got there at six in the morning, all the material. And so what you'll see here is the, uh, the material that was on St. Helena. It was all in Bertrand's papers. It all passed through Napoleon's hands. Some of it is docketed by Bertrand. And there is the only known letter uh, uh, from Napoleon uh, during his exile. Uh, he had that. Uh, so I'll talk about the rest of the details. But my point is, this is pure serendipity. I mean, I went to this show not expecting anything. And I fall into this pit. And um, from that came this, this study. And the first time I showed it at Colopex, but Hennig was the head of the uh, jury, it got the grand award. And he said, the material was so powerful, but your, your presentation is terrible. So he spent two hours showing me how to do it. And I, I, and I then redid it. There was some comment about the fact that the Napoleonic material shouldn't have been included. And I didn't listen to that, I just did it anyway. Um, and uh, so that's the story of how this collection uh, uh, an exhibit was formed. I, uh, I did, uh, it, was in the, it was in the Champion of Champions twice in 87 and 88. I talked at the World Stamp uh, Expo in Washington in 89 about this uh, collection. And uh, my article was published at, at that time, that was a 55th Congress book. And uh, I talked about it in, uh, in September of 2008 at the National Postal Museum's uh, Blunt uh, uh, Seminar. So this is the first time I've talked about it in 13 years. So forgive me if I'm a little <laughs> rusty. I reviewed it a couple of times, but who knows? And I will be, I will be reading from a, uh, a script, but you won't see that because you'll be seeing my slides instead. So uh, Joan, I'm ready. <clears throat> okay, Arthur, you have to put on the screen share. I have to put on the screen. There it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I only take it down. <laughs> okay, so I, I do this. Share. Yeah, you do the screen share. Got it. There you go. Got it. Okay. Everybody can see that. That's the title. 
also history during Napoleon, Napoleon's exile at St. Helena. I, I pronounce it Helena or Helena. It depends on, you know, the correct pronunciation, I believe, is Helena, but I've said Helena so often. And whatever. Anyway, so there were two parallel postal systems uh, during Napoleon's exile, which was from 1815 to 1821. One was for the exiles, and the other was for everybody else, civilian or military. I will first talk about the exiles. Now, everyone knows who this fellow is. Uh, the sketch was made from life on board the Northumberland during the uh, voyage that took him to St. Helena. Well, why was he going there? Well, Napoleon had been wreaking havoc in Europe for years. He was first defeated and exiled to Elba in 1813, but he escaped, raised an army, and started making war again. He was a brilliant commander, but like all such leaders, had the tra tragic flaw of not knowing when to stop. The social changes he brought forth echo to this day, and had he spent his time consolidating those changes, the world may well have been a much different place than it is now. But he fought on, and facing imminent capture, surrendered to the British, whose reputation was one of great leniency towards past enemies. He hoped to be retired to a villa on the English countryside. But England's allies wanted to be sure he couldn't cause any further trouble. So since the British wouldn't turn him over to the French, Austrians, or Germans, who probably would have executed him, they felt compelled to exile him to a place from which escape was virtually impossible. St. Helena, Helena, as you can see, is such a place. Rather forbidding, isolated, 1,200 miles off the African coast, 700 miles from the nearest land, Ascension Island. The terrain and climate were and are, to say the least, difficult. So here's Jamestown, here's the, here's the road up onto the plateau, and this is the view from the sea. Now, this is the road to his home, Longwood. Over here on the right is the house, over here on the left is the road leaving from, leaving from Jamestown is below, and this road is coming up. Coach is going down. Um, so his residence was, uh, uh, at Longwood, as I said, and it's in the middle of the island. So Longwood is right here. I'm sorry, you know, you can't, I can't enlarge. I, if I enlarge it, you wouldn't be able to see, but right here is Longwood. So you had to come up this way, all the way up this way, and over here like this to get there. And this map is, is an 1817 map made by Lieutenant Reed uh, and uh, uh, now, there was a garrison of troops nearby to keep a close watch over him uh, and various comings and goings of his entourage. There were about 100 people who went with him into exile. Before discussing the postal censorship, however, I need to mention that visits to Napoleon at Longwood were also subject to controls. A written invitation to whoever was going to visit was to be sent to the governor, Hudson Lowe. If he approved the visit, the invitation was carried by that person to Longwood. It was then supposed to be handed over by that person to the sentry. In this case, Lord Amherst, Viceroy of India, gave it instead to Count Henri Bertrand, Napoleon's aide de camp, who kept it among his papers. That's how I got it. Dated July 1st, 1817, it reads, in a rough translation, because I'm not very good at French, Count Bertrand has the honor to give his compliments to Lord Amherst and to inform him that the emperor will receive him in his rooms at an hour after midday. Lord Amherst was, Lord Amherst was returning to England and had been directed to visit Napoleon to assess the veracity of some of his claims of mistreatment that he'd been making. As an aside, let me mention that Count Bertrand was the one true believer who never capitalized on his sojourn on St. Helena. His wife accompanied him and his son Arthur was born there. Most others wrote memoirs or gave lectures or brought home souvenirs for sale. For this reason, he was the one selected to bring Napoleon home to France in 1840. So here we have 
you know, famous image of Napoleon. And here's the invitation to Lord Amherst to visit the emperor. Now, Hudson Lowe was the governor at the time and had the responsibility for making sure that Napoleon stayed put. As many as 6,000 troops were on the island at that time, all to keep one man from escaping. I don't think we could understand the paranoia that surrounded the Allies' thinking when it came to Napoleon. That paranoia led to, among other things, strict censorship of all communications to and from him and his party. Lord Bathurst, Secretary for War and the Colonies, uh, speaks in this document right down here. He says, permission to send and receive sealed letters, whether under the color of private business or under any other pretense, is incompatible with the situation of a prisoner of war and is liable to the greatest objections. As such, a relaxation of the existing rules would in effect be to abandon one of the best securities against the successful attempt to escape. Well, he wrote those words to Hudson Lowe in 1818, stating clearly the rationale for the censorship. The regulations were devised uh, uh, by the War uh, and Colonial Office in London, dated July 30th, 1815, finally codified in an act in April 15th of 1816. That's over here. They underwent two uh, major uh, revisions during uh, Lowe's tenure, uh, October of 1816 and October of 1817. And these uh, are all documents from Bertrand's papers. All of them would have been read by Napoleon. These revisions loosened the restrictions somewhat, primarily in the handling of mail matter on the island. How, in fact, did the censorship system work? The clearest demonstration of how incoming letters were treated is found among this, those sent to Count Bertrand by Count Emmanuel de las Casas, who originally accompanied Napoleon to St. Helena. In December 1816, he was deported by Lowe when he was caught trying to smuggle a letter to England. This is recounted in a letter from Dr. Dunlop to his father in Scotland, dispatched from the island on December 31st, 1816, just after Los Casas is gone. Um, I will note that the St. Helena pack, Helena, pack, <laughs> packet letter hand stamp is the second uh, earliest of 13 known. Las Casas left the island on a mission uh, to obtain the help of powerful Europeans in ending Napoleon's exile. He wrote of his progress, or lack thereof, to Bertrand um, in a series of 14 letters sent monthly between January 18th and January, uh, January of 1818 and January and April of 1819. Now I will point out that only five of these letters have been translated and published. The other uh, 13, which I owned, uh, have not been. And uh, that was a silly thing on my part not to have done it, but I didn't. Uh, in any event, here is Dunlop writing, saying there was a secret correspondence uh, was discovered, the nature of which is not known. And uh, uh, blah, 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 and countless Casas was, was uh, exiled. As I said, the, the packet rate was three and six, one and two for the internal rate of 102 miles plus the halfpenny Scottish tax is the rating. Now, because Bertrand was the ultimate recipient of these letters and because he saved everything, it is possible to trace the passage of one of the letters through the system. The first Las Casas letter was written at Frankfurt January 15th 1818, he sent it to the colonial office in London, where Henry Goldburn, Under Secretary for War and the Colonies, the man responsible for the mechanics of the censorship in London, read it, read it, okay, here he is, okay, and Goldburn forwarded Las Casas's letter to Lowe and 
here it is, referring to its contents, which he had discussed with Lord Bathurst. Among the letters forwarded to you by the present opportunity is one from Count Las Casas to Count Bertrand. Now, what follows next is, Lowe apparently sent Las Casas letter to Bertrand immediately because Bertrand had uh, docketed it as being received on June 7th. Three days later, on the 10th, Lowe sent a copy of Goldburn's cover letter and in the last paragraph of his own cover letter showed his awareness of its contents of Las Casas' letter. The governor has the honor to enclose for the information of Napoleon Bonaparte, a copy of a letter he has received from Mr. Goldberg in reference to a subject on which Count Bertrand has been addressed in the last letter forwarded to him by Count Las Casas. This chain is a clear demonstration that the system worked as required by the 1815 regulations. That is, incoming mail read both in London and St. Helena. On the reverse of Las Casas' 11th letter from Mannheim, January 15, 1819, is even more graphic proof. It is a handwritten docket as follows. Right here. This letter was accidentally torn at this office in opening the envelope, signed Henry Goldburn, Colonial Office, February 25th, 1819. The advantage of looking at the backs of letters as well as the interior. I don't have to tell you that though. No examples of outgoing mail that pass through this system have been reported, but evidence that it received the same treatment can be found in a July 27th letter to Bertrand from Hudson Lowe. <clears throat> Up here. The letter you have addressed to me for Count Las Casas will be forwarded to him. Evidence that intra-island communications were handled according to regulations is derived from at least two letters among the Bertrand papers. As an example, one from Lowe to Bertrand dated July uh, 1st, 1816 says, a sealed letter was presented to me this morning by Mr. Porteous, which he had said had been given to him at your house with a request to deliver it to the person to whom it was addressed. I have desired him to return it unopened and acquainted him at the same time of the error he had committed in taking charge of it. Bertrand attempted to bypass Lowe and have the letter delivered directly. The infraction was reported, the letter returned. Penalties for aiding improper communications were heavy. Concerning books, the regulations say nothing specific. In the low papers, Bathurst made clear statements that Napoleon could have any books he wanted as long as they passed through his office. So here you go. A copy of a letter to Lowe from Henry Bunbury, another undersecretary to Lloyd Bathurst, was sent with a covering letter to Lowe, from Lowe to Bertrand confirming. I am directed by Earl Bathurst to acquaint you that 20 packages containing books for the use of general Bonaparte Notice General, have been this day forwarded to the island of St. Helena. Lowe's cover letter states, Hudson Lowe presents his compliments to Count Bertrand and transmits the books which were written for uh, uh, to England. <clears throat> Similarly, no attempt was made to keep newspapers telling of events in Europe from Napoleon since there was little chance he could influence matters there again. An exchange of notes on this subject, between Bertrand and Captain Nichols, orderly office at Longwood, on 28th of August, 1819, uh, uh, in which uh, Bertrand complained about not receiving newspapers, current newspapers. Nichols replied here, Napoleon Bonaparte has had sent to him all the papers that have come to his address, also those of the latest date which go the governor has received. In fact, Lowe often sent newspapers to Longwood that he thought would interest Napoleon. Writing October 16th, 1817, the governor has just received some papers which he loses no time in transmitting to Longwood, 
begging at the request of the person from whom they have been received, they may return as soon as perused. So what were the consequences of the censorship? The direct consequence was that Napoleon refused to write. This is well documented. In a letter to Lucien Bonaparte dated September 1816, Las Casas noted that Napoleon was upset that others would read personal letters from his family. He would rather receive no more letters than receive them on these terms. Upon being told that his own letters must be sent unsealed or else opened, he said, in these circumstances, the, the emperor deems it advisable to renounce letter writing. Therefore, the rarity of stuff written by Napoleon on St. Helena. So Walter Scott predicted that the attempt at censorship <clears throat> would fail because the severity of the regulations would be bound to engender a certain amount of sympathy that would help create an active market for trafficking and clandestine correspondence. Las Casas, in a letter to Lord Bathurst from Frankfurt, December 1817, referred to his deportation for smuggling, saying, I availed myself of the right of any captive, that of deceiving his jailer. Such smuggling is well-known tactic today, and it was certainly well-known to the British at the time, as they watched one smuggled dispatch after another being published in the pop popular press. The arrest and deportation of Las Casas, noted above, is merely the most famous incident. When the British government decided to reduce its expenditure for the Longwood establishment in July of 1816, Napoleon offered to pay his own way if he were permitted to write a sealed letter to his bankers. Bathurst wrote to Lowe saying that Lowe might permit Napoleon one sealed letter to the mercantile house in London for the purposes of arranging financial matters, if Lowe thought it advisable. But Lowe did not permit it an error in judgment. And so, as much to embarrass Lowe and the British as anything else, Napoleon had much of his silver plate and broken up uh, to be sold for scrap. It was a grand gesture, fiscally unnecessary, but politically brilliant. An account of the sale, apparently smuggled out, appeared in Lantagali Khan in early of 1817, and recreated so much sympathy for Napoleon and it created much sympathy for Napoleon. The only known extant letter signed by Napoleon during his final exile was written at this time directing Bertrand in the distribution of the funds arising from the sale of his broken silver. If you read French and have the time, I'm happy to send you a copy of this. From the Bertrand archive comes the only extant example of a smuggled document, the tiny, tiny handwriting meticulously done by Etienne Saint-Denis, Napoleon's second valet. Now, this obviously was not sent, it was a, pra a practice document, but this is what they look like. A true one has never been found. This sa sample contains a famous declaration made by Napoleon dated August uh, uh, 16, 1819, uh, which was published by Antomarchi in his memoirs, among other places. Several of these letters, apparently smuggled and perhaps written in code, appeared in various newspapers, the most famous being the so-called Lantagallican affair alluded to above. Similar undertakings were reported to have occurred in the Morning Chronicle and the Times, papers of a Bonapartist hue. Illustrated here, is an overlay cipher, quote, found among the papers of Napoleon as doctored in the upper left corner. This over here, by the way, is A.B., probably Arthur Bertrand. No, it couldn't be, he was too young. It must be Count Bertrand. In any event, it could be used for four different codes, being asymmetric and numbered uh, one and two on the front, and three and four on the back or reverse. The cipher begins towards the middle of the page and follows the arrows. Now I have to tell you, when I exhibited this, when I exhibited this, one of the great pleasures that I got was watching children come and see this and with their finger 
trace this, seeing how it would have been used. Is there any better way to teach history? Unfortunately, no example of a letter written using the cipher is known, but why have it if it wasn't used? A hint that it might have been used occurs in a letter from Goldburn to Bathurst dated August 4th, 1820, in which he notes Hudson Lowe's complaint about having to read immensely long letters of exquisite insensibility. Might not that have been the necessary disguise for a letter requiring an overlay cipher. The most audacious method and successful only once was Bertrand's disingenuous conduct surrounding the dispatch of Napoleon's famous observations on a speech by Lord Bathurst. Bathurst had made that speech before parliament uh, in March of 1817, defending the treatment of Napoleon, which was the responsibility of his office. The speech was recorded in the Morning Chronicle. Napoleon read the report. He constructed his rebuttal over a period of time, and it was finally ready, ready in, October, in October. He sent it to Lowe on October 7th in a sealed envelope addressed to Lord Liverpool, the prime minister. Lowe on the 21st wrote to Bertrand saying that it was against regulations for him to send a sealed letter to London. Bertrand, Lowe asked Bertrand if there were any complaints in that sealed letter requiring his comments. On the 27th, Bertrand wrote back saying, yours of the 21st of this month relates to a letter I sent to you on the 7th of October for Lord Liverpool. That letter has now been in your hands 20 days. It is a property of your prime minister. He was stonewalled. Hudson Lowe replied to Bertrand that in the absence of a response to his question, he was sending the letter to England unopened. And so on the 30th, he sent the still sealed letter to Bathurst with a cover letter in which he apologized for sending it unopened. He explained that he felt that delicacy required it, even though he was certain it contained complaints against him. It did indeed complain, contain complaints. In a letter to Lowe dated January 1st of 1818, Bathurst chastised him. Oh, this is docketed by Bertrand here as well. <clears throat> I have received and forwarded to the Earl of Liverpool the sealed package enclosed in your dispatch. Although Count Bertrand's conduct gave you fair reason to infer that the package contained nothing upon which it could be necessary to require your observations or reply, that is Lowe's, and thereby induced you so far to deviate from your instructions as to transmit it unopened, the delay must now take, which now, must now take place has been altogether occasioned by the disingenuous conduct which has been practiced upon you. I am sure that in the event of any other sealed letters being sent to you for transmission, you will see the expediency of not permitting any feeling of delicacy to interfere with the strict execution of your instructions. Hudson Lowe never again permitted himself to be fooled in such a manner. He had asked Bertrand as a gentleman whether there was anything he needed to comment on. He sensed that there was something, but his code required him to, to assume that no response meant no comment was needed. Ah, things should be that well handled today. In summary, the British sought to prevent Napoleon's escape from St. Helena, not only by a large military garrison, but also by censoring his communications. It is not at all certain that Napoleon ever seriously entertained the notion of escaping. So to the extent that which the, the, the censorship helped prevent it is mute. The regulations and their application led to considerable conflict between the residents of Longwood, the governor and the British uh, in, in London and to a never ending propaganda war. It material help, materially helped Napoleon to build his legend and the popular acceptance of his allegedly poor treatment. The system dis, uh, dis, demonstrably worked as set forth in the regulations. The exiles successfully circumvented the censorship by smuggling, sending coded messages, 
using overlay ciphers, probably, and by deceit. That it was necessary to institute, institute some form of censorship is generally agreed. That it was doomed to failure was inevitable. Okay, now let me look at the second postal system serving civilians on St. Helena at this time, civilians and military personnel. I should mention that there was no causal relationship between the two systems, uh, which were both initiated during 1815. Passage of an act resulted in the proclamation by the governor of St. Helena on February 20th, 1815 for the establishment of a post office at the wharf, initially under the, direct, the direction of William Brabazon. The act also created a network of packets which served St. Helena, among other places, which complemented the private ad hoc ship letter service. This official St. Helena post office ceased operations on July 14th, 1819, not to begin again until January 1st, 1840. Ship letter service only was available during the time of closure. This chart shows the rates and routes available. So you can see here, this is, this bridges the uh, egg period of exile. Here are the packet letter rates plus the internal. And here there were no packets during the second part. And then again, uh, the rates. Uh, there's an India letter rate, but I've never seen one. Uh, the, the routes out of England bypass, because of the, uh, of the, the, the winds, bypass closely, close to Brazil, coming to Cape Town and beyond. But home, homeward bound, it stopped at St. Helena, bypassing Ascension, although sometimes I suppose stopping there uh, to return. Uh, so St. Helena to London was 4,500 miles, 1,700 miles to Cape Town, 700 miles uh, to Ascension, and 6,700 miles to Madras. <clears throat> There was no internal. Hold on a second. Where did it go? Ah, I'm sorry. I passed it. Uh, there was no internal mail delivery at any time during the exile. Uh, actually not until way much later in the 1860s. Intra-island letters were hand-carried as in these two examples. What you clicked that? ahead, Arthur. There it is. You the got slightest it. touch, I breathe on it and it does that. So we have one dated March 14th, 1817 to Sir Thomas Reed at Prospect Hill, uh, who was in Prospect Hill, uh, sent to Jamestown. A second, from Dr. Uh, Verling at Longwood, sent by Hudson Lowe. Uh, and Dr. Verling was the uh, 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 physician uh, attached to the uh, 66th um, Regiment uh, uh, guarding Napoleon. And he was physician to Napoleon, uh, as a matter of fact. Now the packet letter rate was three and six per sheet, whereas a ship letter rate was apens per sheet. There are, as one would expect, more ship letters and packet letters during this period. The only known and earliest packet letter not to have used the oval hand stamp, this one, is dated May 23rd, 1816, presumably before the arrival of that device from England. It received an India packet letter hand stamp. As a double weight letter, it is properly franked nine and four, three and six twice for packet, one and two twice for the internal rate of 405 miles. The oval St. Helena uh, was subsequently used always in black. The earliest known being August 24th, 1816, of which there are three known. All but one are from the Dunlop correspondence. The single exception is this one, dated March 29th, 1817, rated uh, four and two for the three and six packet and eight pence internal for 79 miles to Mrs. Ruth, Ruth Green in Hampshire. 
the latest use of the hand stamp is April 2nd, 1819, just before the closure of the St. Helena Post Office. The only known use over here um, of the oval after the closure is March 2nd, 1820. The clerk recognized that it was not a packet letter and charged one and six. We don't know the point of arrival. It just says ship letter, although somebody may be able to recognize where that ship letter uh, hand stamp was placed. But since I don't know the, the point of arrival, I can't be certain whether uh, uh, whether this is a double weight uh, or a uh, uh, or a single rate and eight pence for internal. In the absence of a way to compel use of the of the packets, most letters were sent by private ship at eight pence per sheet. This example. What did I do? Sorry. Here it is. <laughs> this example was sent October 22nd, 1815. Doesn't take much, does it? Um, the second earliest after Napoleon's arrival, rated one and eight for a pen ship letter uh, via Falmouth and a shilling internal rate 270 miles to Twickenham. Just before the post office closure on July 13th, this is dated June 17th, this double weight ship letter was sent to deal via deal to London, rated two and eight for the double rate, eight pence times two, and eight pence internal rate 75 miles times two. The high rate of postage induced some users to bypass the postal system completely, <clears throat> sending letters by someone returning to England and placing it in the mail there, thus avoiding either the packet or ship letter rates. And this is what we call a bootleg letter. Further, as noted, noted in a letter from the governor to his adjutant during September of 1818, attempts were made to include private letters with official correspondence saying the largest of the boxes with the company's mark, the company being uh, military, on them sent up this morning contained only private letters, a large mail of them, thus defrauding the revenue. In the fall of 1840, Count Bertrand was sent to St. Helena to oversee the exhumation of Napoleon's body for return to France and his final resting place at Edmalid. His son, Arthur, who was born on the island, accompanied him. To bring the saga of Napoleon's residence on St. Helena to an end, I show two local hand-carried letters to Bertrand, one to him at St. Helena, and the other a few days later, once he had boarded La Belle Pool, the frigate, for the return trip home. Any questions? So Owen, you're, you're on for getting rid of this. <laughs> oh, okay. You want do I do something share. here or do you do it? Stop share. I'll do it. No, carry on. You can stop share? <laughs> yeah. You can stop share if Did you it. want. There, there you go. go. Great. So you don't need me. I don't so, need you. And we have a bunch of time for anybody who wants to ask any questions. We will. The first one, as I'm, I'm going to bring some people over as, oh, as I ask questions. But um, just just for some of us who are not really up on our Napoleonic history, how did Napoleon die again? Well, it's not clear. Um, some say stomach cancer. Some say it was mercury poisoning uh, as a treatment for uh, syphilis. Uh, nobody really knows. Nobody really knows. No. It, 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 to this day, it's it's debated. Okay. So we're going to go through some of the questions that people put in uh, the Q&A. And as I promote you to a panelist, feel free to ask Arthur your questions directly. But uh, there's John Fitzpatrick wants to let you know that 
there that Rao company in New Orleans is claiming that they have Napoleon's desk for sale. Any interest? Napoleon's what? Desk, I guess oh. writing desk. Yeah, well, there are a bunch of those, and no, I'm not interested in it, but uh, somebody in <laughs> France probably would be. Although I understand there's a very avid collector of Napoleonic material here, and I think that's where my, this collection uh, ended up. It was broken up, I think. Uh, uh, it was sold intact, and I never should have sold a Napoleonic section, but I did. That was 30 years ago. <laughs> so one of those regrets. Oh, wow. So there is a so, serial collector here someplace. Okay, so now, um, what role did letters play in Napoleon's escape from Elba? Do you, do you no know idea. that one? No, I have no idea. Probably not okay. much. My guess is it was pretty close to Europe and he just arranged something. I really don't know. Okay, so John, uh, since air service was started, have you been able to visit St. Helena? And if so, were you there long enough to do anything on the island? No, it is. Uh, it, when I was collecting, there was no air service. And so it was, you, you went there and you had to be on there two weeks before the next ship came back. And uh, once the air service started, uh, I was already done with my St. Helena collecting. So I, I've never been there. It would be an interest place, interesting place to go for a couple of days, I would think. But two weeks is too much. Yeah, that sounds it. Um, okay, did censorship end with Napoleon's death? You mean censorship, as far as he's concerned, yes. Everybody packed up and went home. Oh, his whole I mean, entourage, everyone was... Free. Oh, yeah, they all, yeah. I, I mean, once he died, he couldn't escape, he couldn't cause trouble, so... I assume the censorship was lifted, although I, I've not seen a formal uh, uh, document stating that, but I would assume it just lapsed. <clears throat> okay, and with the correspondence you exhibited, was the postage paid by the sender or the receiver? Receiver. The receiver would be. Okay, and how long did the letter take to reach England? <laughs> Anywhere from, I mean, I had a chart for that, but anywhere from two to six or eight weeks, it depended on how it went, what the weather was like, you know, and so on and so forth. Uh, so really, it's not, it, it, yeah, just, you just look at the letters and you look at the, the, the dates. It's usually sometime around a month. Okay, and I am going to recognize Pat Walker, who had his hand there up. There he is. A question. Hey, Dan. Uh, this is Dan Walker. Yes. How are you, Dan? Dan Walker, nice. sorry. I saw Pat's name. So. <laughs> Dan and Pat Walker. Yeah, okay. Um, question for you. Many years ago, I looked at a uh, exhibit by Russ Scaverol, and he had a overlay cipher uh, 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 as part of his St. Helena collection. It doesn't look like that was the one that you own. Well, you know, there was there were other people who were exiled there. Right. I mean, during the Zulu Wars, I mean, you know, I, I would have to see it to, to, to be able to say, is it dated from that time or is it later? OK. Uh, you know, uh, that's a great memory to remember that. Good grief. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I, I saw, uh, saw the cipher overlay, I said, oh, who was it? And I finally got <laughs> Russ Gavril's name and. And, and, Isn't that interesting? Uh, well, he, he wrote about it. He wrote about his collection, so I'm going to look it up now. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. By the way, I should mention that I wrote the article I wrote for the for the Congress book. If you look at it, it's a formal um, uh, uh, academic article in that every single piece of of uh, information that I showed you. I went to the British Library, I spent two days looking at Hudson Lowe's papers, and I correlated everything that I had with the, the original material that was in the Hudson Lowe papers. So uh, it's a doable thing. And uh, oh. so anyway, carry yeah, on. Harold, you, you, oh, Harold, oh, you have your hand up, you have a question? Yes, yeah, just a comment, uh, in, incredible presentation, just Thank you. fascinating. And, um, 
it's my understanding that there were some elevated, um, relatively elevated levels of arsenic in um, Napoleon's hair, which led to a lot of speculation that he might have been chronically poisoned over time. Oh. Um, it, it would be interesting to, to, to see if there were a way of, of non-destructively looking at some of the correspondences, whether they have elevated arsenic in them. Well, although I didn't, <laughs> well, he didn't write. Right. But, <laughs> you know. Well, well actually, yeah, the, the, the thing is that arsenic was used for a number of things uh, in those days, treating a number of diseases. So, uh, you know, he, he, we know he had bad uh, 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 abdominal problems and it was used in low doses for all sorts of things. So uh, it's not clear whether he was poisoned. I'm not even sure that he had syphilis, but, uh, you know, it was, uh, 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 there have been, a, there were a number of, of uh one, one of, so I just saw somebody pop up here with a comment about the detailed uh, uh, autopsy that was done on him. But despite that, there has still been some, uh, uh, some uh, uncertainty as the precise cause of his death. Yeah, just very interesting and great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Derek, you have a question. Hi, good evening. How are you? Great. This was a fantastic presentation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Now, I have a question. And interestingly enough, my question is not specifically about uh, Napoleon, but the, the Dunlop letters keep coming up. And I have a couple of covers. One of them, reportedly, is the first cover from Grenada to ah. here, Scotland. Ah. And I, I try to understand how widespread was this family and how prominent were they, why so much letters are popping up and very interesting pieces from way back when. Was, was, was it addressed to the father and heir in Scotland? It was addressed to Mr. Litgo and it's dated 7th of April 1785. Oh, it's got a, it must be a different, it, it's either, well, it was probably a military or naval family, but that's, that was, that wouldn't have been the same Dunlop. I think it was, it was, you know, 30 years later, but okay. I'm sure there is, I'm sure there is a, a relationship, you know, going off Thank to you. those islands, you know. <laughs> Uh, Dan, you have another question. I do have another question, uh, just on the Dunlap situation. As a uh, former collector of uh, Grenada, there is a lot of 17th, uh, 1700s and 1800s correspondence uh, to a Dunlap in Scotland. Right. I, I have no idea whether it's related to uh, uh, this situation, but the, the Dunlap correspondence uh, from the Caribbean, uh, uh, from the Grenada, at least, uh, yeah. the Caribbean is is uh, fairly common. Right. If it's if it's to the same address and air, then my guess is uh, these were family members. Did not necessarily have to be the same guy in 1816, but certainly uh, I'm sure that there was uh, you know family and uh, uh, you know that that spread out. You know, they were either the military that went from island to island, or they were just people who who, who you know resided there and, and maintained their connections. Just like from Bermuda. <laughs> in the archives in Glasgow, there are a great number of um, early Grenada uh, letters. Uh, and I'm, I looked at them in you know, the 70s and 80s. And uh, uh, the, there was also ones in my collection that were to the Dunlap people. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Somebody should do a history, find out who they were. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that was certainly fantastic. There's a lot of questions in the Q&A and I'm trying to bring everyone over as quickly as possible, but um, if you want priority, just raise your hand and I will get to you um, first. Yeah, so. Uh, in your, in your, your study of it, how much of the censorship was genuinely effective and how much of it was 
how much of it do you think may have actually not really been that effective? Well, I'm pretty sure that everything that went in and out was censored. I think I think that, that we're pretty certain about that. Obviously, a lot of things got out by the methods that I mentioned by subterfuge. Uh, the I would think that that's a relatively small percentage. I would think the vast majority was was uh, there's no there's no way to know, but I suspect that the vast majority uh, was. Because remember, there's very little correspondence that that out in the in the world here uh, to the uh, to the exiles on St. Helena. It was, you know, uh, most of what we have is, uh, is uh, civilians and military. So uh, it's, a, it's a difficult question to answer, but I would suspect the vast majority was, was censored. When the, they had the Boer prisoners on St. Helens. 1890s, yep. Yeah, did how much of uh, their censorship program did they based on Napoleon's. I have no, I have no, I, I'm sure they changed. I, I, I have no idea what, I mean, I know that there's a zillion censor marks there and so forth, but that, that's not my area of, uh, of, uh, of expertise. I mean, you know, they, they, there were guys who read the letters and put their stamp on it. And so it's a little less formal than going through, you know, through London and so on and so forth. So, so uh, I assume it was a local you know, censored locally, uh, either in or out. Derek, you had another question? Or I guess he just forgot. Raj, you have Sorry, a question. No, yeah, it, it's just fascinating. I, you, you mentioned uh, that there were thousands of uh, soldiers on the island when Napoleon was uh, in exile there. Letters to and from soldiers, was, was there, is there any uh, record of uh, censorship of uh, those? No. No. No, the, to, the, to and from the soldiers was just handled, uh, you know, in the regular, in the regular way. There was, there was, of course, a special rate but uh, but uh, there was no evidence for any censorship of military or civilian mail. The soldiers to be stationed on Helena did um, from their correspondence. Have you seen what that they regard? There's some duties that it's like an honor to get this to be assigned this duty, and sometimes it's a pain. It's a pain in the tuckus to get this. Where does Saint Helena stand in this? Well, there are we have very few letters from uh, from soldiers, so we really don't have much uh, uh, much uh, yeah. to, you know, to, to go on. <clears throat> um, so I, I really can't answer your question. I'm sure that there were some positions that were like the physician or the you know, the sentry or something like that, but most of these guys were grunts, you know, and uh, they grinned and bared it. <laughs> Because I was thinking, John, my, you have a sorry, John. I'm sorry, uh, my brother. John, you have a oh, sorry. Okay, no, go on in. My example is that my brother got out of a quiet firehouse because he wanted to get promoted to a more active one. And in in, a, in all the armed forces, it's like there's being sent to Alaska, and there's there's, there's Guam, and there's Germany, and you know, it, there can be a real. That can be that can be say a lot. That can be a real uh, down downturn for your career and an upturn for your career. I don't, I don't know that there was any. I don't know much about the hierarchy. Uh, you know that that occurred in those days. Uh, you know we know what happens with the officers, but what happened with the enlisted men, I I really don't know. Okay, sorry. Oh, oh, Coach, may I may I um, just add that. Uh, it's worthwhile mentioning that St. Helena, St. Helena before um, the Suez Canal was opened was essentially run by the India office. And when you came to the British Library all those years ago, you would have seen the India office uh, uh, records, which, which are there. And just as a, 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 on another subject, uh, it's 30 years ago, probably just at the very, very time that we both worked on the Crawford Library Catalog, right. which came out uh, all that time ago. It's uh, imagine we're getting to all flash past. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, I hope to be over. Uh, to make a, a point about 
the um, that Stein correspondence. Uh, I've just been doing some work on Dr. Gary O'Meara, who, uh, after we'll know, is um, almost the continent of Napoleon in the, between 1815 and 1818. Um, mm -hmm. And if any of you are with one of the international um, ancestry databases online, if you go and look at oh, I can close 1818, down. 1841, there is an awful lot of Barry O'Meara's correspondence <laughs> that he argues in the public sphere with uh, Hudson Lowe. So you can see um, some of that clandestine correspondence coming through in his arguments that he holds in public and embarrasses Lord Liverpool because he, Barry O'Meara, uh, has been dismissed from the Navy for being involved in sending out clandestine correspondence uh, in the island. I, I, it's wonderful, these byways. I love them. John, you had another, you have a question? Me? Yep, you, well, John it's, Spencer. It's, yeah, it's more, more a comment, really. Um, related to uh, Napoleon's exile, it wasn't just St. Helena that was involved. Uh, the, the British set up a naval garrison on um, Ascension Island and on Tristan de Kuna to prevent the the French taking over those islands and perhaps uh, launching a, a, a rescue bid for Napoleon. Did that uh, make it the big to do with that? More so the, the letter than the... Yeah. I, you know, I, I wasn't aware of that, but neither am I aware that there was ever any serious attempt to get him off the island. I mean, they were, presumably they were worried about it, but there was never any, there's no, there's no evidence that he seriously thought he was going to get Yeah, I went to Panera and got a, a strawberry salad. Hey, who's not oh, weird? John, you didn't share. As a result of <laughs> buying stuff there, I have another half salad. Okay, we... John. <laughs> <laughs> okay, is everyone okay, hungry? Uh, Norm! You... On that? <laughs> In the low correspondence, um, <laughs> there is really only one set of papers that look at an attempt to launch some sort of commando raid to get him off the island, which, and it's all gossip, it's all gossip. Um, yeah. There are some French exiles, yeah, Arthur, yeah, Arthur's nodding there. And if you um, go to Barry O'Meara's book, A Voice from St. Helena, um, Napoleon in his, uh, in his conversations with O'Meara says, um, I, 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 basically, I will never lower my dignity uh, to actually try and uh, escape from the island. Uh, yeah. Because, of course, one of the great things he feared was being slapped down. He was furious about not being given the title of emperor by the government. Yeah. And, of course, officially he was referred to as the general, as I've already mentioned. Yeah. Um, but you also said to Amira, that I will never officially tell the governor that I'm just too worn out to start running down valleys in the middle of the night to get to the seashore. <laughs> I, I, I went to the island uh, a while ago, and this won't surprise anybody here as I talk on and on, uh, and I've written a book about it. Um, and I, I walked from um, all, all the way down uh, one valley, London Valley, uh, to photograph some um, military installations, and I and I nearly fell about thirty feet um, <laughs> from the shale path. And some of the images that you will see make him out to be more than portly. He was only ever slightly portly, but remember, he's he's, he's, he's almost fifty when he gets there. He's yeah. a hard physical life, and no way is he in a physical condition to yeah. he's going to be. Be smuggled in a long wood down that road that Arthur's planted out, and, and then not the, a chance. The, the rocky coastline. Yeah. Have you read Lord Rosebery's? Have you read Lord Rosebery's three volumes on Napoleon and Saint Helena? Sorry, sorry, I missed that. Oh, Rosebery. Yep. Yeah, because I, I mean, I, I, he's got fabulous footnotes 
And that's, and, and, and uh, of course, it's a British point of view. So you can take the same facts from the French point of view and they're going to be looked at differently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, just, just so. Yeah, uh, brilliant man. Um, where per ground hell. Um, and when, when we look at all, all the work that happened in this period, uh, as um, Andrew Roberts has written in Napoleon the Great, of this, the seven great wars against Napoleon, six of them were started by the Allies. Um, and the other thing you've got to remember is, is that, and I say this as a Brit, uh, there was a tremendous amount of secret service money put in to try to assassinate Napoleon at the beginning of his reign. Because people said, well, they're a, they're a decent bunch of folks, aren't they? Just like the Americans. And uh, it's an awful time to be an ordinary working man or woman in Britain, even during the war. Life is hard, and the government, fearful of invasion, um, is very ruthless at times. So, yeah, seven great wars involving Napoleon. Oh, he was such an ogre. To some extent, that's true. But six of those wars were started by the likes of Britain, Austria, uh, and Russia, the great powers of Europe. Yeah. Thank you. John, you have a question. I muted you, so you have to take yourself off mute. John Spencer, just unmute yourself. Uh, hold on, oh, you have yeah, to unmute yeah, yourself. Yeah, 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 yeah. John, do you got that? We'll go to Norm first, and then uh, John, if you could unmute. Oh, you did it. John? Sorry. I, uh... I've left my hand up. I forgot to take it down after I made my comment. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm not Norm, you have a... I usually just interrupt, but there we are. <laughs> That's okay. okay. Uh, Norm, you have a question. Yeah, I really enjoyed this, Arthur. It was a terrific presentation. My question is, have you read the book by uh, Alan Schrom? Uh, Napoleon. No, when was that written? Uh, this was written. It's a it's a huge book, and uh, it's one of three books, and uh, was written back in. I think I would know that by looking at it, but uh, nineteen ninety seven. No, it's hard to what have a she... show. Oh, yeah. That's interesting. What does she have? Yeah. What does she have? What okay. does she have? Yeah, I haven't I haven't read it, but I, I have to I have to admit that once I wrote the article and talked about it, I move on. I hear you. <laughs> when you got when you got this load of stuff, incredible correspondence and yeah. at home, what did you what was your first thought when it ended up on your well, table? Well, wait a second. See this? This is what I kept. The okay. And everything else you saw. Everything else, everything else was gone. And uh, I felt terrible, but I loved having it. Right. Uh, uh, because it, 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 I'll never do anything as important from that point of view. I, mean, I worked with the, with the, with the, a professor of French history here in at Vassar, uh, wrote a Rappaport, mm -hmm. wrote this article, and she tried to get it published for me in the, in the, you know the the literature, the, uh, the appropriate literature. I'm not a historian, I'm not doing it. Fantastic, I so, understand. So they ended up in the in the in the yeah, as I say in the uh, Congress book, and and I sent around and the the uh, uh, the bibliography to a number of French scholars, right. uh, but I haven't seen anything written that, you know, anything new written that that, that, okay. that might have, have, have read this. Well, there's a couple of chapters that towards the end, obviously at the end of the book, and yeah. they talk about poisoning, and he was yeah. murdered, and yeah, they go we, into this whole scenario that I you know, talked I know. about. I know. And uh, at yeah. any rate, I enjoyed it. I appreciate uh, it. What yeah. a once in a lifetime experience you had. 
That was it. An opportunity I'll never do anything as important again. You got it. <laughs> Thank Before you. Before you go, Norm, yeah. I need the name of that book, that name and author of the book. Okay, it's possible. Napoleon Bonaparte. And it's Alan, A L A N S C H O M. Now, this was the first of three books that he wrote that are all involved uh, with Napoleon. The second one is The Hundred Days. Mm -hmm. And the third book is Trafalgar. And uh, this book does spend a fair amount of time with Napoleon in Egypt. Uh. And the overall feeling you get when you get done with this book is Napoleon spent most of his life and most of his battles winging it. It was like, okay, well, let's do it. And not a, lot of Russia. <laughs> not a lot of background, just <laughs> he had the feeling for it, he went for it. Yeah, well, he shouldn't have done Russia. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed, indeed. At any rate, thanks a okay. lot. What's somebody else? Yes, I appreciate it. Terrific. There's that whole Napoleon Society that I, I oh, reached yeah. out to some of the people to attend. I'm I'm not sure if anyone here is a member of that society, but if you are, you know, welcome, because uh, I I found it fascinating, and I thought you might enjoy author's talk. Right. Okay, um, Michael Clark, you have a question. Um, uh, question um, and a comment. Uh, first, the comment is that. Um, I feel a little bit like um, one of your groupies that we've met several times at the Greenwich Ephemera Society. Um, so I want to first counter what you said, that this was a once in a lifetime. Everything that you've done has been outstanding and creative and tremendously intellectual and stimulating. So, Thank you. Um, uh, Thank but you. the question was, they must have kept track of his visitors. Oh, yes. So, I'm sure um, they did. My guess is that that would be in the in the Hudson Low papers, uh, but I wasn't particularly interested, you know, in in that because I I had the one document that that showed, you know, the, the way it would it would have been handled. In his papers, though, there would have been the returned ones. So I suspect, you know, uh, if you want to go over there and look through, I think the, the 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 part when he was on St. Helena was maybe a couple of boxes. So I mean, it would take a couple of days to go through it. Yeah, did, they keep, did they keep track of his visitors after they returned home to see what they got up to? No, oh, I have no idea. <laughs> May I? Yeah. There is Go right ahead, Paul. Yeah, there is some... By the way, I'm, I'm the editor of the um, Journal of the Waterloo Association, ah. which is effectively the, the, the Wellington Society, but uh, the current Duke thinks it's a bit too big-headed to be called the Wellington Society. Mm. Um, so, but I'm a great fan of Napoleon, but don't tell the rest of our members. Um, yeah, the, there is some evidence in the Low Papers, and the, the Low Papers are massive because Sir Hudson Low, who I think is much maligned by me, oh yes, oh yes, he he is meticulous about recording everything, and you you, you could spend years in there. You could build a house out of the Low Papers. Yeah. Low papers. And again, as, as Arthur's indicated, there's, there's only a hint in these papers about anything to do with espionage and following uh, people. Right. There is some correspondence about following the, uh, some of the servants of Napoleon who basically were, who lost their jobs. Mm. And it was, at, there was sort of at a diplomatic level, um, the Austrians kept tabs on, on some of the servants. And don't forget, of course, that one of the, the Bonaparte brothers came to the States, and um, there, are, there is at least one of essentially the uh, staff who, who ends up going to see um, Louis in, in, in America. Uh, and he's up to New York. Yep, that's it. He ha doesn't he get a, a, a bigger state yeah. in New York? There's a town named after him. Right. It's right. in the west side of, 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 uh, of the Adirondack Park. Right. I've never been there. I don't think there's anything there, but I mean, it's just, it did exist and that's where he was. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so he, um, there's only a slight amount of cor correspondence on, on that point. Yeah, yeah. But you're right, he was, oh, he, he was given an impossible task and he did it to the best of his ability. 
and he really was uh, 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 a much better administrator than people give him credit for. And, and he, he, he was a, a very, a very, he was a self-made man. Yep. He was the, the son of a, effectively a junior middle-class army officer himself. Yeah. And the, the, and again, the, the Napoleon was uh, all round. He, he was a genius and he was ahead of his time. But he started to believe his own legend that he was busy creating. That's right. Uh, and, and that's one, one, it's classic. one of the tragedies of, of the man. That's right. It's the, it's the, the, the tragic flaw, you know, that all those great men. What have. was the name of that town in, in the it's end of the It's called Napoleon. Napoleon? There's a town called okay. Napoleon. And uh, Paul, would it be okay to post a link to the Waterloo Society in case anyone like is it. interested? Like, yeah, well, yes, we've, 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 um, we, we, we've got a, a fairly extensive uh, website uh, and we've got all sorts of uh, documentation and, and bits and pieces up there. I, I, I've got an hour talk on my perspective on essentially that job. I think you can possibly access. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not a great tech man. Um, oh, yes. And the, sorry, the other point I wanted to make, he was deliberately sent to Centralina, which was owned by the Honorable East India Company, because um, he's, he, he, Napoleon, has, out, has almost outfoxed himself because he's on Elba the year before, mm -hmm. and, and he famously escapes, lands in France, gets to Paris, and then raises his army, and then marches to Waterloo. But, I mean, he, he'd lost before he got to Waterloo, because, basically, the French people had had enough, after 20 years, of losing their sons to conscription. Um, and even if he'd beaten Wellington, there were, there were huge enormous Austrian and Russian armies turning around that were still marching back to their homeland who were going to just come back and, and steamroll it. So he, he would never have got it yeah. whatsoever. But because he got off the little island of Elba um, in between Italy and Corsica, where he was born, the, the European monarchs were just so fearful. Give him to the British. They've got the biggest navy in the world and they can probably send him somewhere really isolated and it was even suggested that he, he was sent to scotland uh, a little place called dumbarton on the Clyde, which has got a tiny castle and you have one gate that was suggested the west indies was suggested and i think uh, in the end it is um a senior man in the admiralty john barrow who had um i think it, he had a lot of correspondence, and I think John Barr had actually visited Centrally, who said, we have a map. And if you go, go to the British Library, it's a fantastic map, by, map by um, Captain John Barnes of the Army. And John Barnes had also written a um, commentary to go with the map that, that actually graded all the potential landing points on the island. And there are hardly any landing points on the island. Plus, the South Atlantic rollers keep coming in on one side. And you would need a desperately sound rowing boat to get in safely and then to get out again on the south side. And with, with only one other place, um, you could cover this easily. And by the time he's there, there is this huge, huge campaign to rebuild artillery positions and build extra artillery positions all the way around the island. We were so fearful of it that we sent him to the middle of the ocean where hopefully he would be forgotten about. And for most people, I think, they did forget about it because, as, as always, if you've lost your son in war and your husband, your brother, etc., after 20 years, you've had enough. And, and I think that's a fundamental point that, that, that needs to be borne in mind yeah, when dealing with this. Sorry, time to shut up. Uh, no, 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 that was fascinating. Arthur, it must be like, really amazing to sit there and hold that material <laughs> in your hand. <laughs> These are the actual documents that Napoleon read because they were the documents that were sent, the copies, the handwritten copies that were sent from Hudson Lowe to Bertrand to read 
because he didn't get the originals, Bertrand. He got these, these, you know, true copies. He read them. Napoleon read them. And the, the, the regulations that were docketed, same thing. They were clearly handled and read by, by Napoleon. Yes, it's quite remarkable. <laughs> it's quite remarkable. The value of lateral thinking. <laughs> Just from a simple, eh, you know, what do I know? You know. Who authenticates the Napoleonic? Uh, That's the, right. Who, who authentic, authenticates that material? It seems to me there's more pieces of Napoleon than there are pieces of the true cross. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Good. Oh, are there any more questions for Arthur? Any more comments? Are there someone with a. I love the flag, Marcio. I've, I've got a comment. Thank you very much, Arthur, for a very nice presentation. A pleasure. Probably from my own personal aspect, this presentation is the most educational and uh, enlightening webinar I've attended. Thank you. And it's good. You should never have sold it. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, if I wanted to collect something else, I had to sell it, you know. <laughs> For a millionaire, I could have kept it. <laughs> okay, any, any more comments? I mean, we're here as... Should we all go for a wine? No, someone was ordering <laughs> Panera. Did it arrive yet? <laughs> okay, Savina. Okay, any more questions, comments? Or are we all gonna go eat dinner? Leslie, thank I, you for I joining got, us. My just let me just let me say, just let me say to Raj uh, that incoming letters to St. Helena are not all that common. Here. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was Pleasure. wonderful. Pleasure. Thank you. Goodbye. Everybody have a good evening. Don't eat too much. Thank you. We enjoy it so much. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you, And my pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Savina, hi. Hi. Hi, Joan. How are you? I'm sorry. I'm sorry I came late, but I'm I enjoyed every minute. Oh, thank you. Frederick, you're welcome to unmute, you know, and say something. There was a comment earlier about uh, visiting St. Helena. Never been there myself, but there was an APS stamp chat uh, earlier this year about a fellow who rode the ship that goes from Cape Town to uh -huh. St. Helena, right. the freighter that carries passengers. Yep. Uh, very very interesting a... stamp chat. Showed images of, of the ship, the post office there today. Yep. You can see that on the APS YouTube channel. I think it's the Union Castle. At least they are the ones that used to do it. I don't know if they still do. Uh, sorry, Art, I don't remember, uh, but uh, that uh, Snapchat is on the APS YouTube channel. Okay, well, check it out. Yeah, we also had a gentleman earlier, speaking of the, the internment camps, who was a collector of all the St. Helena, which is fabulous, fabulous stuff. Oh, yeah. So falling you never get out. Oh. <laughs> and I see Ed Grabowski. Nice to see Ed Grabowski here. Hey Ed, how are you? Haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> Let's see if he's he's off camera. Uh, well, okay. Very good. Any any other questions, comments? Let's, again, I, I love the background. Marcio and thanks. Thank you all. Welcome. Have a good evening. Are you from France? Are you in France? Or are you? No, I, I'm in Honduras. But since I want to have something appropriate for the presentation, magnificent <laughs> presentation made by Arthur. So thanks. Thank well, thank you for joining us.
Welcome. Hmm. Paul, do you have any more comments? Anthony? Well, only to say that the RMS Centralina has um, been taken out of service. There is now a more functional um, merchant vessel that ha now only has, uh, as I understand it, uh, less than 10 uh, bunk spaces for, for passengers. Uh. But in large measure, because of course there's the new air, there is a new airport um, which which flies uh, not at the moment because of the COVID restrictions, uh, but it is now far easier to get to the island uh, by going to Johannesburg in South Africa and then flying out. Hmm. Uh, when uh, we went, um, because my wife's been to Centralina twice, uh, she was hmm. posted there. Uh, a few years ago with, with, with her, her university. Uh, sorry, sorry, large white cat. Ah, um, beautiful. Right, keep going, cat. Um, uh, I think it wants feeding. Um, so it's, it is a little bit easier, but you have to go via um, yeah. Johannesburg. And I think when things get better, with uh, there has been a new key uh, built at St. Helena because it's always very difficult for any cruise ship to get there. But with this new key, I think there might be some idea, perhaps in the future, of, uh, of a cruise ship. Um, yeah, well, you know, they'll screw it up like they did Galapagos, so leave it be. <laughs> <laughs> After, I, I, I suspect you're right. 